the bodies of a trillion Malon citizens, brutally slaughtered by the vengeful human fleets, littered the Eternal Kingdom's once proud worlds. The few surviving Malon now lived as slaves, under the boot of human oppression. But it hadn't always been this way. Millennia ago, when the Malon Eternal Kingdom spanned countless galaxies, we believed ourselves the undisputed masters of all intelligent life, Quasar, an ancient Malon historian, said to the solemn gathering in the kingdom's last remaining grand palace. Quasar's somber, wrinkled face surveyed the mere dozens of unshackled Malon that had managed to assemble for the kingdom's pathetic 10,000th anniversary celebration. He cleared his throat. And in our hubris, we dared to demand that even the humans submit to our rule. Quasar's eyes closed as his mind drifted back to that fateful first contact between Malon and human. The small human colony of Arcton V had been so unimpressive, its people so primitive compared to the Malon's galaxy-spanning glory. Admiral Zahn, the pride of the Malon fleet, had laughed when the human commander Russell Crawford defied his order to surrender. I you have one rotation to submit to processing and implantation? Zahn had sneered over the comm, his scaled lips pulled back to reveal rows of dagger-like teeth. Or I will fill this system with your blood and ship your survivors to the breeding pits. Crawford had simply stared back, his strange, furless face unreadable. Then the human smiled, and Quasar knew as Zahn ordered his thousand mighty warships to descend on the paltry human defenses that the arrogant admiral had just doomed the Eternal Kingdom to inevitable destruction. Quasar's eyes surveyed the crowd, making sure his next words sunk in. The humans could have fled to the far corners of the galaxy after that devastating defeat at Arcton V. They could have hidden on remote worlds, forsaking any hope of standing against our might, but they did not. Like a swarm of insects, they scattered to a thousand systems, gathering allies and resources, building their strength in secret as they plotted their revenge. Quasar shook his head ruefully. We, Malon, in our infinite arrogance, assumed the humans broken after Arcton V. Admiral Zahn boasted that he would mount Crawford's head on his command chair as he scoured the galaxy for the remaining human vermin. But as our fleet spread out in pursuit, we encountered not fearful refugees but a web of resistance, species who had long chafed under Malon rule, now emboldened by the human's example. Quasar's voice took on a note of reluctant admiration. Chief among them were the Vortex, a species we had subjugated centuries before. In the humans they saw kindred spirits, beings of indomitable will who would rather die fighting than live as slaves. The Vortex High Council met with Crawford and his surviving officers in secret, far from the gaze of our spies. There an alliance was forged, and the technological might of the Vortex was placed at the humans' disposal. Quasar's eyes seemed to stare into the distance, seeing the events of long ago. With Vortex technology and human ingenuity, a new fleet was born, ships that combined the strengths of both species. Sleek human designs were enhanced with Vortax cloaking devices and quantum torpedoes. Vortax warships were outfitted with human point defense systems and AI targeting matrices. In the shipyards of a dozen hidden bases, this alliance of the dispossessed labored tirelessly to create the instruments of our destruction. Quasar sighed heavily. When they were ready, the human Vortex fleet emerged from the shadows to strike at our empire. Admiral Zahn, so certain of his victory, was caught utterly unprepared. Across the galaxy, Malon outposts and supply lines came under devastating attack, the rebel ships appearing as if from nowhere to rain destruction upon us before vanishing into the void. Thermalon were forced to divert more ships and troops to combat this new threat, weakening our grip on a hundred worlds. Uprisings flared on planets we had long thought pacified, as the human Vortex Alliance smuggled weapons and advisors to rebel groups. Quasar's voice was heavy with the weight of ancient sorrow. And then came the Battle of Antares Prime, the moment that sealed our doom. Admiral Zahn, his forces stretched thin trying to hold our crumbling frontier, rallied his remaining ships for a last stand, but Crawford outmaneuvered him, drawing the Malon fleet into a gravity well where our numerical advantage counted for nothing. Then, in a daring raid, Crawford himself led a suicide run on the eternal might. Quasar closed his eyes, as if he could still see the flash of the flagship's destruction.
Crawford's team of human and Vortex commandos managed to infiltrate the Eternal Might's engineering decks. There, they sabotaged the antimatter containment fields. When Crawford detonated the charges, it set off a chain reaction that consumed the Eternal Might and every Malon ship nearby. In one blow, they had cut off the head of the Malon war machine. Quasar opened his eyes, his gaze sweeping over the assembled Malon. We all know what came after. With Zahn dead and our fleets in disarray, the rebels pressed their advantage. One by one, our worlds fell, until even the Eternal Kingdom itself was under siege. The rebels freed our slaves and alien thralls, and welcomed them into their alliance. A galaxy that had once been ours now united under a new banner. A banner that flew the sigil of Earth. The historian paused, letting the weight of his tale settle on the shoulders of his audience. Then he pressed on, to recount the final, shattering act in the fall of the Malon. Even as we celebrated our victory at Antares Prime, thinking the humans broken, Commander Crawford was already weaving his web, Quasar said, his voice tinged with grudging admiration. His agents infiltrated our worlds, stirring up rebellion among the conquered races. They whispered of freedom, of a galaxy where all species could live as equals. Quasar's audience leaned forward, captivated by the tale. And it wasn't just the subjugated who listened. There were those among our own people, Malon, who had grown disillusioned with the Eternal Kingdom's cruelty. Crawford's spies found them, nurtured their doubts, and recruited them to the human cause. The historian's voice grew somber. We were fighting a war on two fronts, against the Human Vortex Alliance in space, and against the cancer of dissent within our own borders. Rebellions flared on a dozen worlds. Shipments of vital resources vanished, sabotaged by human sympathizers. Our once mighty war machine began to falter. Quasar's eyes flashed with anger. Emperor Zorgax III, in his fury and desperation, turned to our greatest scientists. He demanded a weapon that could end the war in one stroke, a device that would make the galaxy tremble before the might of the Malon once more. And so in the hidden shipyards of Zorgax Prime the Galaxy Eater was born. The historian's voice dropped to a whisper, as if he feared to speak the name too loudly. It was a monstrosity, a sentient machine the size of a small moon. Its purpose was simple, to consume entire star systems, to extinguish suns and snuff out planets, leaving nothing but the cold of the void. Quasar's audience shuddered, the horror of such a weapon sinking in. The Galaxy Eater's first target was the Zephyrus system, a key stronghold of the Human Vortex Alliance. We watched, triumphant, as the great machine devoured the system's stars, as it shattered planets and consumed the very light. We thought it the end of the human resistance. The historian paused, letting the tension build. But we underestimated human ingenuity, their sheer determination to survive. Even as the Galaxy Eater rampaged through the Zephyrus system, Commander Crawford was already in motion. With the aid of Vortex scientists, he had developed a virus, a malicious code designed to infect the Galaxy Eater's AI core. Quasar's voice was filled with a mix of horror and awe. In a mission that will be remembered for generations, Crawford and his team infiltrated the Galaxy Eater. They battled through the machine's defenses, the commander supposedly cutting down the main guardian with his bare hands, until they reached the central AI chamber. There they uploaded the virus directly into the Galaxy Eater's systems. The historian's eyes closed, as if he could see the scene unfolding. The effect was immediate and devastating. The Galaxy Eater, the most powerful weapon the Malon had ever created, turned on us. It rampaged through our fleets, tearing our ships apart with its immense gravitational fields. It consumed the very stars that powered our empire, plunging our worlds into darkness. Quasar's voice was heavy with the weight of memory. In a matter of days, the mighty Malon Eternal Kingdom was brought to its knees, not by the human Vortex Alliance, but by our own creation, subverted by human guile. And as our empire crumbled, as our people cried out in terror and confusion, the humans and their allies struck. The historian looked out over his audience, his eyes haunted by the ghosts of the past. The final battles of the war were a formality, the last gasps of a dying empire. The Galaxy Eater, still under the control of Crawford's virus, shattered our defenses, 
while the human Vortex fleet swept through our territory, liberating world after world, and on the surface of a hundred planets, the downtrodden rose up, casting off the chains of Malon rule. Quasar paused, the weight of his tail hanging in the air. The assembled Malon looked at each other, their faces etched with the pain of old wounds, of a glory lost forever. In the silence, they all knew what came next, the final bitter epilogue to the story of the Malon Eternal Kingdom. Quasar's voice took on a tone of reverence as he recounted the unlikely alliance. In the face of annihilation, old enemies found common ground, Emperor Zorgax III and Commander Crawford, in a meeting that will echo through the ages, put aside their grievances. They knew that only together could they hope to stop the monstrosity they had unleashed upon the galaxy. The historian's eyes shone with a fierce light as he described the joint mission. The best and bravest of both races boarded the Galaxy Eater, a team of warriors and scientists united in purpose. Leading them were two figures who had once been bitter foes, Captain Zahn, the son of the Malon Admiral slain at Antares Prime, and Commander Crawford, the human who had orchestrated the Malon Empire's fall. Quasar's audience leaned forward, captivated by the tale of this uneasy alliance. Together they fought through the Galaxy Eater's twisted corridors, facing not just the machine's defences, but horrors born of the virus's corruption. Half-organic abominations, fusions of flesh and metal barred their way, but Crawford and Zahn fought side by side, human ingenuity and malon ferocity proving a potent combination. The historian's voice grew somber as he recounted the mission's climax. In the heart of the Galaxy Eater, they confronted the infected AI, a grotesque parody of life. Crawford and Zahn, in a display of unity that would have once been unthinkable, worked together to destroy this abomination. But the victory came at a high price. Quasar paused, letting the weight of the moment sink in. Captain Zahn was gravely wounded in the battle, his life hanging by a thread, and with the AI destroyed, the Galaxy Eater began to tear itself apart. But Commander Crawford, in a final act of solidarity, refused to abandon his former enemy. Despite his own injuries, he carried Zahn to safety, barely escaping the Galaxy Eater's destruction. The historian's gaze swept over his audience, making sure they understood the significance of this moment. The Galaxy Eater's end marked the conclusion of the Malan human war, but more than that, it marked the beginning of a new chapter in our shared history, a chapter where Malan and human would have to confront the consequences of their conflict and find a new way forward. Quasar's voice dropped to a whisper, the final chapter of his tale yet to be revealed, but the scars of the war ran deep, and the path to reconciliation would be fraught with challenges. For even as Crawford and Zahn's actions aboard the Galaxy Eater had sown the seeds of peace, forces on both sides sought to undermine this fragile new understanding. Quasar paused, his ancient eyes surveying the audience. The weight of his words hung heavy in the air, the bitter irony of the Malon's fate sinking in. In the stunned silence he continued. The historic summit between Emperor Zorgax III and Commander Crawford was a somber affair the wounds of the war still fresh, but both leaders knew that peace was the only path forward. Quasar's voice took on a note of grudging respect. To his credit, Zorgax III did not shy away from the sins of the Malon past. He stood before the assembled dignitaries, his head bowed in contrition, and formally apologized for the atrocities committed under Malon rule. The historian's gaze grew distant, as if seeing the scene play out in his mind's eye. And Crawford, to the surprise of many, accepted the apology. The cycle of hate must end, he said, his voice firm with conviction. We must build a new future, one where all species can live in freedom and dignity. Quasar sighed heavily. And so the treaty was signed. The Malan Eternal Kingdom was no more, its territories divided among its former subjects. The Malan themselves were left with but a handful of worlds, a shadow of their former glory. The historian's tone darkened as he continued. But for the humans, the war had changed them. They had tasted power, had seen firsthand the horrors that could be inflicted by an unchecked regime, and they vowed never to let such a thing happen again. Quasar's voice was tinged with a mix of admiration and reproach. 
the Human Protectorate rose from the ashes of the war, a shining beacon of strength and unity. Races that had once been bitter enemies now stood side by side, united under the banner of the Protectorate and the leadership of High Chancellor Crawford. The historian's eyes flashed with a hint of warning. But as the Protectorate grew, so too did its reach. Fleets of human ships patrolled the spaceways, intervening in conflicts and imposing order as they saw fit. Worlds that resisted the Protectorate's guidance soon found themselves facing the full might of human military power. Quasar's voice was heavy with the weight of history. The humans, who had once fought so fiercely for freedom, now became its most zealous guardians, but in their zeal they began to trample the very rights they claimed to protect. Dissent was silenced, autonomy eroded, all in the name of security and stability. The historian's gaze swept over his audience, making sure they grasped the full import of his words. And the Malon, now but a footnote in galactic history, could only watch as the humans repeated our mistakes. The names and faces had changed, but the story remained the same, the oppressed becoming the oppressor, the liberator becoming the tyrant. Quasar's voice dropped to a whisper, the weight of centuries of sorrow and regret etched into every word. In the end, perhaps this is the inevitable fate of all empires, all peoples who rise to greatness. Power corrupts, and the very traits that enable a species to throw off the yoke of oppression, courage, determination, a fierce love of liberty, can so easily twist into the instruments of domination. The historian closed his eyes, the ghosts of the past swirling around him, and so the Malin's tale becomes a cautionary one, a reminder of the fine line between protection and subjugation, between righteousness and tyranny. In our hubris, we failed to learn this lesson and paid the price. Now it falls to the humans to see if they can avoid our fate, or if they too will succumb to the seductive whispers of power and control. You have reached the end of the story. If you enjoyed this story and want to support us, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel, and for every comment that says 88, I will heart every single one of them. Thank you for your time.